Two years later, he took the three children to Hong Kong. My father had some combination of legitimate business and hucksterism, Musk recalls. He left us in the hotel, which was pretty grungy, and just gave us 50 bucks or something, and we didn't see him for two days. They watched samurai movies and cartoons on the hotel TV. Leaving Tosca behind, Elon and Kimball wandered the streets, going into electronic stores where they could play video games for free. Nowadays, someone would call the Child Protection Service if someone did what our dad did, Musk says, but for us back then it was a wondrous experience. A Confederacy of Cousins After Elon and Kimball moved in with their father in suburban Pretoria, May moved to nearby Johannesburg so the family could be closer together. On Fridays, she would drive to Errol's house to pick up the boys. They would then go see their grandmother, the indomitable Winifred Haldeman, who cooked a chicken stew the kids hated so much that May would take them out for pizza afterward. Elon and Kimball usually spent the night at the house next door to their grandmother's, where May's sister Kay Rive and her three boys lived. The five cousins, Elon and Kimball Musk and Peter, Lyndon, and Russ Rive, became an adventurous and occasionally contentious bevy of bucks. May was more indulgent and less protective than her sister, so they would conspire with her when plotting an adventure. If we wanted to do something like go to a concert in Johannesburg, she would say to her sister, I'm going to go take them to church camp this evening, says Kimball. Then she would drop us off and we would go do our mischief. Those trips could be dangerous. I remember once when the train stopped, there was an immense fight, and we watched the guy get stabbed through the head, says Peter Rive. We were hiding inside the car, then the doors closed, and we were like moving on. Sometimes a gang would board the train to hunt down rivals, rampaging through the car's shooting machine guns. Some of the concerts were anti-apartheid protests, such as one in 1985 in Johannesburg that drew 100,000 people. Often brawls would break out. We didn't try to hide from the violence. We became survivors of it, says Kimball. It taught us to not be afraid, but also to not do crazy things. Elon developed a reputation for being the most fearless. When the cousins went to a movie and people were making noise, he would be the one to go over and tell them to be quiet, even if they were much bigger. It's a big theme for him to never have his decisions guided by fear, Peter recalls. That was definitely present even when he was a child. He was also the most competitive of the cousins. One time when they were riding their bicycles from Pretoria to Johannesburg, Elon was way out in front, pedaling fast. So the others pulled over and hitched a ride in a pickup truck. When Elon rejoined them, he was so angry that he started hitting them. It was a race, he said, and they had cheated. Such fights were common. Often they would happen in public, the boys oblivious to their surroundings. One of the many that Elon and Kimball had was at a country fair. They were wrestling and punching each other in the dust, Peter recalls. People were freaking out, and I had to say to the crowd, this is not a big deal. These guys are brothers. Although the fights were usually over small things, they could get vicious. The way to win was to be the first person to punch or kick the other guy in the balls, Kimball says. That would end the fight because you can't continue if you get crunched in the balls. The student. Musk was a good student, but not a superstar. When he was 9 and 10, he got A's in English and math. He is quick to grasp new mathematical concepts, his teacher noted. But there was a constant refrain in the report card comments. He works extremely slowly either because he dreams or is doing what he should not. He seldom finishes anything. Next year, he must concentrate on his work and not daydream during class. His compositions show a lively imagination, but he doesn't always finish in time. His average grade before he got to high school was 83 out of 100. After he was bullied and beaten in his public high school, his father moved him to a private academy, Pretoria Boys High School. Based on the English model, it featured strict rules, caning, compulsory chapel, and uniforms. There he got excellent grades in all but two subjects, Afrikaans, he got a 61 out of 100 his final year, and religious instruction, not extending himself, the teacher noted. I wasn't really going to put a lot of effort into things I thought were meaningless, he says. I would rather be reading or playing video games. 
He got an A in the physics part of his senior certificate exams, but somewhat surprisingly, only A B in the math part. In his spare time, he liked to make small rockets and experiment with different mixtures, such as swimming pool chlorine and brake fluid, to see what would make the biggest bang. He also learned magic tricks and how to hypnotize people, once convincing Tosca that she was a dog and getting her to eat raw bacon. As they would later do in America, the cousins pursued various entrepreneurial ideas. One Easter, they made chocolate eggs, wrapped them in foil, and sold them door to door. Kimball came up with an ingenious scheme. Instead of selling them cheaper than the Easter eggs at the store, they made them more expensive. Some people would balk at the price, he says, but we told them, you're actually supporting future capitalists. Reading remained Musk's psychological retreat. Sometimes he would immerse himself in books all afternoon and most of the night, nine hours at a stretch. When the family went to someone's house, he would disappear into their host's library. When they went into town, he would wander off and later be found at a bookstore, sitting on the floor, in his own world. He was also deeply into comics. The single-minded passion of the superheroes impressed him. They're always trying to save the world, with their underpants on the outside or these skin-tight iron suits, which is really pretty strange when you think about it, he says. But they are trying to save the world. Musk read both sets of his father's encyclopedias and became, to his doting mother and sister, a genius boy. To other kids, however, he was an annoying nerd. Look at the moon, it must be a million miles away, a cousin once exclaimed. Replied Elon, no, it's like 239,000 miles, depending on the orbit. One book that he found in his father's office described great inventions that would be made in the future. I would come back from school and go to a side room in my father's office and read it over and over, he says. Among the ideas was a rocket propelled by an ion thruster, which would use particles rather than gas for thrust. Late one night at the control room of his rocket base in South Texas, Musk described the book at length to me, including how an ion thruster would work in a vacuum. That book is what first made me think about going to other planets, he said. Russ Rive, Elon, Kimball, and Peter Rive. For the Seeker. Pretoria, the 1980s. Existential Crisis When Musk was young, his mother started taking him to Sunday school at the local Anglican church, where she was a teacher. It did not go well. She would tell her class stories from the Bible, and he would question them. What do you mean, the waters parted, he asked. That's not possible. When she told the story of Jesus feeding the crowd with loaves and fishes, he countered that things cannot materialize out of nothing. Having been baptized, he was expected to take communion, but he began questioning that as well. I took the blood and body of Christ, which is weird when you're a kid, he says. I said, what the hell is this? Is this a weird metaphor for cannibalism? May decided to let Elon stay home and read on Sunday mornings. His father, who was more God-fearing, told Elon that there were things that could not be known through our limited senses and minds. There are no atheist pilots, he would say, and Elon would add, there are no atheists at exam time. But Elon came to believe early on that science could explain things, and so there was no need to conjure up a creator or a deity that would intervene in our lives. When he reached his teens, it began to gnaw at him that something was missing. Both the religious and the scientific explanations of existence, he says, did not address the really big questions, such as where did the universe come from, and why does it exist? Physics could teach everything about the universe except why. That led to what he calls his adolescent existential crisis. I began trying to figure out what the meaning of life and the universe was, he says. And I got real depressed about it, like maybe life may have no meaning. Like a good bookworm, he addressed these questions through reading. At first, he made the typical mistake of angsty adolescents and read existential philosophers such as Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Schopenhauer. This had the effect of turning confusion into despair. I do not recommend reading Nietzsche as a teenager, he says. Fortunately, he was saved by science fiction, that wellspring of wisdom for game-playing kids with intellects on hyperdrive. 
He plowed through the entire sci-fi section in his school and local libraries, then pushed the librarians to order more. One of his favorites was Robert Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, a novel about a lunar penal colony. It is managed by a supercomputer, nicknamed Mike, that is able to acquire self-awareness and a sense of humor. The computer sacrifices its life during a rebellion at the penal colony. The book explores an issue that would become central to Musk's life. Will artificial intelligence develop in ways that benefit and protect humanity, or will machines develop intentions of their own and become a threat to humans? That topic is central to what became another of his favorites, Isaac Asimov's Robot Stories. The tales formulate laws of robotics that are designed to make sure robots do not get out of control. In the final scene of his 1985 novel Robots and Empire, Asimov expounds the most fundamental of these rules, dubbed the Zeroth Law, a robot may not harm humanity, or, through inaction, allow humanity to come to harm. The heroes of Asimov's Foundation series of books develop a plan to send settlers to distant regions of the galaxy to preserve human consciousness in the face of an impending dark age. More than 30 years later, Musk unleashed a random tweet about how these ideas motivated his quest to make humans a spacefaring species and to harness artificial intelligence to be at the service of humans. Foundation series and Zeroth Law are fundamental to creation of SpaceX. The Hitchhiker's Guide the science fiction book that most influenced his wonder years was Douglas Adams's The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The jaunty and wry tale helped shape Musk's philosophy and added a dollop of droll humor to his serious meme. The Hitchhiker's Guide, he says, helped me out of my existential depression, and I soon realized it was amazingly funny in all sorts of subtle ways. The story involves a human named Arthur Dent who is rescued by a passing spaceship seconds before the Earth is destroyed by an alien civilization that is building a hyperspace highway. Along with his alien rescuer, Dent explores various nooks and crannies of the galaxy, which is run by a two-headed president who had turned unfathomability into an art form. The denizens of the galaxy are trying to figure out the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. They build a supercomputer that after 7 million years spouts out the answer, 42. When that provokes a befuddled howl, the computer replies, that quite definitely is the answer. I think the problem, to be quite honest with you, is that you've never actually known what the question is. That lesson stuck with Musk. I took from the book that we need to extend the scope of consciousness so that we are better able to ask the questions about the answer, which is the universe, he says. The Hitchhiker's Guide, combined with Musk's later immersion into video and tabletop simulation games, led to a lifelong fascination with the tantalizing thought that we might merely be pawns in a simulation devised by some higher-order beings. As Douglas Adams writes, there is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is another theory which states that this has already happened. Blaster In the late 1970s, the role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons became a popular obsession among the global tribe of geeks. Elon, Kimball, and their rive cousins immersed themselves in the game, which involved sitting around a table and, guided by character sheets and the roll of dice, embarking on fantasy adventures. One of the players serves as the dungeon master, refereeing the action. Elon usually played the dungeon master and, surprisingly, did it with gentleness. Even as a kid, Elon had a whole bunch of different demeanors and moods, says his cousin Peter Rive. As a dungeon master, he was incredibly patient, which is not, in my experience, always his default personality, if you know what I mean. It happens sometimes, and it's so beautiful when it does. Instead of pressuring his brother and cousins, he would turn very analytical to describe the options they had in each situation. Together they entered a tournament in Johannesburg, at which they were the youngest players. The tournament's dungeon master assigned their mission, you have to save this woman by figuring out who in the game is the bad guy and killing him. Elon looked at the dungeon master and said, I think you're the bad guy. And so they killed him. Elon was right, and the game, which was supposed to last a few hours, was over. 
the organizers accused them of somehow cheating and at first tried to deny them the prize. But Musk prevailed. These guys were idiots, he says. It was so obvious. Musk saw his first computer around the time he turned 11. He was in a shopping mall in Johannesburg, and he stood there for minutes just staring at it. I had read computer magazines, he says, but I had never actually seen a computer before. As with the motorcycle, he hounded his father to get him one. Errol was bizarrely averse to computers, claiming they were good only for time-wasting games, not engineering. So Elon saved his money from odd jobs and bought a Commodore VIC-20, one of the earliest personal computers. It could play games such as Galician and Alpha Blaster, in which a player attempts to protect Earth from alien invaders. The computer came with a course in how to program in BASIC that involved 60 hours of lessons. I did it in three days, barely sleeping, he remembers. A few months later, he tore out an ad for a conference on personal computers at a university and told his father he wanted to attend. Again, his father balked. It was an expensive seminar, about $400, and not meant for children. Elon replied that it was essential and just stood next to his father staring. Over the next few days, Elon would pull the ad out of his pocket and renew his demand. Finally, his father was able to talk the university into giving a discounted price for Elon to stand in the back. When Errol came to pick him up at the end, he found Elon engaging with three of the professors. This boy must get a new computer, one of them declared. After he aced a programming skills test at his school, he got an IBM PC slash XT and taught himself to program using Pascal and Turbo C++. At age 13, he was able to create a video game, which he named Blaster, using 123 lines of basic and some simple assembly language to get the graphics to work. He submitted it to PC and Office Technology magazine, and it appeared in the December 1984 issue with a short introduction explaining, in this game, you have to destroy an alien space freighter, which is carrying deadly hydrogen bombs and status beam machines. Although it's unclear what a status beam machine is, the concept sounds cool. The magazine paid him $500, and he proceeded to sell it two other games, one like Donkey Kong and the other simulating roulette and blackjack. Thus began a lifelong addiction to video games. If you're playing with Elon, you play pretty much nonstop until finally you have to eat, Peter Rive says. On one trip to Durban, Elon figured out how to hack the games in a mall. He was able to hotwire the system so that they could play for hours without using any coins. He then came up with a grander idea. The cousins could create a video game arcade of their own. We knew exactly which games were the most popular, so it seemed like a sure thing, Elon says. He figured out how the cash flow could finance the machines. But when the boys tried to get the city permits, they were told they needed someone over 18 to sign the application. Kimball, who had filled out the 30 pages of forms, decided that they couldn't ask Errol. He was just too hard of a human, Kimball says. So we went to Russ and Pete's dad, and he flipped out. That basically shut the whole thing down. 5. Escaped Velocity Leaving South Africa, 1989 Jekyll and Hyde At age 17, after seven years of living with his father, Elon realized that he would have to escape. Life with him had become increasingly unnerving. There were times when Errol would be jovial and fun, but occasionally he would become dark, verbally abusive, and possessed by fantasies and conspiracies. His mood could change on a dime, Tosca says. Everything could be super, then within a second he would be vicious and spewing abuse. It was almost as if he had a split personality. One minute he would be super friendly, Kimball says, and the next he would be screaming at you, lecturing you for hours, literally two or three hours while he forced you to just stand there, calling you worthless, pathetic, making scarring and evil comments, not allowing you to leave. Elon's cousins became reluctant to visit. You never knew what you were in for, Peter Rive says. Sometimes Errol would be like, I just got us some new motorbikes, so let's jump on them. At other times, he would be angry and threatening and, oh fuck, make you clean the toilets with a toothbrush. 
When Peter tells me this, he pauses for a moment and then, a bit hesitantly, notes that Elon sometimes has similar mood swings. When Elon's in a good mood, it's like the coolest, funnest thing in the world. And when he's in a bad mood, he goes really dark, and you're just walking on eggshells. One day Peter came over to the house and found Errol sitting in his underwear at the kitchen table with a plastic roulette wheel. He was trying to see whether microwaves could affect it. He would spin the wheel, mark down the result, then spin it and put it in a microwave oven and record the result. It was nuts, Peter says. Errol had become convinced that he could find a system for beating the game. He dragged Elon to the Pretoria Casino many times, dressing him up so that he looked older than 16, and had him write down the numbers while Errol used a calculator hidden under a betting card. 